Hello. In this vis video, we're going to look at mannerism in the 16th century, specifically in Italy. Now, mannerism is a short um, movement at the tail end of the Renaissance when um, the Italian Renaissance artists were looking for a um, they were looking for a, a way to transition with using high Renaissance technique, um, but and then adding a a more um, individualized style and aesthetic to um, what had become at the tail end of the Renaissance uh, a there was a point where Artists in Italy felt like they really could not uh, go much further with Renaissance uh, ideology. Also, there was a, uh, a sense of indulgence and uh, in the, the style of mannerism. This, uh, this individualism, this focus on style that was so important during this time period is a reflection of the society and the changes in society that directly led to a backlash or a, in the rest of Europe against what was seen as the overindulgence of the corruption of the church. So their mannerist painters, mannerist artists are trying to make um, works that are, that have some of the same techniques of the Renaissance, realism, um, use of color, strong sense of contrast, but also add to it an individualism, whether it's, a whether it's in so choices of subject matter, whether it's in the way and style of the, of the imagery, uh, or it's just taking liberties with story, with style, with technique that uh, Renaissance artists just were not free to do and able to do. So we're, we're going to look at three painters, a sculptor, and then uh, just a couple of little architectural pieces to see how Rena the Renaissance is evolving through the Mannerist. Now, this is Parmigianino's Madonna with the Long Neck. And it's titled that because her neck is so strongly elongated. And that's, that really is sort of a reflection of what was happening in the Mannerist. Instead of just purely focusing on realism, on proportion and balance, on the influence of the classical and connecting that to the religious that we might have seen through the Renaissance, now we're going to see artists take some liberties they're going to make some decisions that you may or may not have seen artists in the past take and make um, in terms of the way that they organize the space, the way that they fill the frame, the way that they use figures and, and shapes, um, and, the, and especially the way that they elongate and stylize those figures. So Parmigianino becomes famous for these very elongated figures. Um, he he stretches the figures to because they felt like that that made them feel and seem more elegant. Now, his technique is still very strongly influenced by the Renaissance. The use of light and dark, the high contrast, the classical forms, the, the figures and the way they're organized, the way they overlap, the way they use perspective, the way you, they show depth. All of these elements are strongly, strongly um, a reflection of what was happening in the Renaissance. But now it's going to be much more stylized. Now, so if mannerism is, is mostly about style, it doesn't mean that the technique suffers. It just means that it's used for a different purpose. Um, now, now, there are cases where, and images where, um, that stylization overwhelms the realism. So, for instance, here, Parmigianino's image of the conversion of St. Paul, he, he cares less that the figure, especially the horse, seems out of proportion. The head's in a, in, you know, entirely too small to fit this large body, um, but he's exaggerated it for effect. He wants the, 
the the horse to be grand and elongated. The neck is intentionally elongated because elongated necks were seen as elegant and even on horses, apparently. Um, but it's very dramatic. It's very theatrical. Manner of style uh, wants to create this high drama and, uh, and th uh, th theatricality that we'll see later reflected uh, in other European styles of later centuries, uh, most notably of the Romantics and the Baroque that we'll see uh, in the in success, success, successive centuries a little bit later on, the 17th and 18th century. Now, um, Parmigianino is notable because he's he is part of this transitional period, taking Renaissance techniques, what they learned by looking at the masters, what they learned by looking at Leonardo and Raphael, and then applying it. Uh, in a more stylized way. Each artist of the Mannerist period, you know, they have their own style. They, it's not a, there's not a one size fits all to this. Um, there's not a, an accepted way that you make a Mannerist stylized painting. Um, this is by Tintoretto. He's such named, that's not actually his name, that's what he's called, because he works with tints, he works with colors, he's a colorist. And so his focus is going to be heavily upon an exaggeration of theatricality, a dramatization of color, a stylization of color. Um, he turns the halo into a glow of light around the figure. The figures glow with that inner light. He uses the dramatic lights and darks. He uses high contrast, um, but he does it in his own very stylized way. It's almost abstract, these works. And, and ultimately, that's, um, you know, it's moving away from realism just as a, as a defining factor to imagery. We're going to see... Uh, much more of a focus on doing what uh, you want to do rather than just doing what's expected of you. Tintoretto's most famous work is his version of The Last Supper, and we see it in stark and dramatic contrast to Leonardo's. The scene is much more lively. The scene is, is uh, dominated by light and his use of light and color and contrast there's uh, an, a, uh, his Tintoretto takes great liberties in how he depicts the scene and what he includes, um, the, you know, all these figures and these ghost figures and these floating angels and these, uh, and all the servants and the, it, it, the scene is just full, full of activity and color and space and light. Um, and it's, it really is uh, a very different view of painting that instead of everything being frontal and everything being stark and organized, it's more natural. It feels a bit more candid um, because it's, it's more individual. It's Tintoretto's view. Um, the, uh, another important uh, Italian mannerist is Jacopo Pontormo. Now Pontormo is interesting because he incorporates often um, subtle kind of classical elements, um, but, uh, but not really connecting at all to realism. Here, this is his view of Joseph in Egypt. So this is supposedly after, uh, you know, the Joseph has, has taken Jesus and Mary to Egypt, and here he's walking around, and, and they're, he's bringing the Messiah with him, but this is definitely not the Egypt that we would think of, right? There's classical Greek sculpture everywhere and columns and and does not feel very Egyptian. But of course, this is Pontormo taking those liberties. This is Pontormo um, making his view of what he considers that he thinks it might be. So, you know, the point is, is that it's not... Um, mannerism is a style based upon individual decisions of the artist. It would not have happened without the Renaissance, without the development of art and the importance of art and the focus on art of the Renaissance. There would be no mannerism because these artists would not have been allowed, have felt the freedom to do uh, this type of image making and these and make these types of decisions that went against tradition. Now here we see in Pontormo's 
uh, entombment of Christ, his Christ taken down from the cross, we see these bright, bright colors. Um, again, the stylization, the colorization, taking just uh, you know, and, and the imagery to a whole different place than we'd anything we'd seen before. Um, it's not very realistic, but he doesn't care. He's trying to make something fanciful, something almost wistful, um, and it's it really is uh, a an individual focus. So Parmigianino wants to create these stylized figures that are elongated, and Tintoretto wants to use intense contrast and lights and darks and colors, and you know, Pontormo wants to kind of take as many artistic liberties, both with color and technique and with subject matter, as he chooses. And we see that very strongly in his works. Now, in terms of sculpture, Mannerist sculpture is um, reflects that same idea. It takes a lot of classical elements from the Renaissance, uh, the figure, the form, the posture, the pose, but it, it, uh, it definitely takes some liberties of subject matter and some liberties of, uh, of, of pose. Um, here, his uh, abduction of the Sabine women by the Romans, a classical story. So here, the Romans carrying off the Sabine woman and the, in what has got to be the most unfortunate uh, compositional placement of a figure in the history of sculpture, this poor Sabine man is being just basically stepped over and by the Roman. And he, you know, it, it's uh, he's very dramatic, very theatrical, but, uh, you know, almost overwhelmingly so. And that's ultimately uh, what uh, Bologna, the sculptor, his, he wants to make grand gestures. He wants his style to be... Uh, you know, very, very theatrical and very um, imposing with his works. You know, this is also the beginning of a movement towards public sculpture again. And um, we, we had seen some of that in the Renaissance, so quite, quite a bit of it. But the difference is that the public sculpture of the Mannerist and the, then on into the Baroque is, uh, is going to be um, more more classical, more allegorical, more, uh, you know, just have quite a, a variety of form and, and, and figure. So here, the Bologna makes this um, image of Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea, as part of this monumental fountain. Fountains from the Mannerist through the Baroque became very, very important sculpted forms, um, very public figures, So in, and very often moved away from uh, religious themes towards more classical or uh, allegorical themes. And so, you know, not only does he sculpt the, the figure, but he sculpts the base, the pedestal, the fountain itself, the workings, and the water becomes a part of the, the sculpture. It really, he's trying, they're trying to think of sculpture in different terms, instead of just thinking it, of it as something to be placed on a pedestal to be looked at, even in the round, is part of the environment. Bologna becomes famous for his sculptures that are part of the landscape and part of either the, the, the piazza, the, the plaza, or uh, a part of the garden. Garden sculpture becomes important, like we see here. Uh, this carving of this figure, this kind of ancient elemental figure emerging from the, the rock. And again, it's a, it's very dramatic. It's It's just... Uh, you know, really, really remarkable way of thinking about sculpture that we haven't seen before. But he'll be influential on a lot of the Baroque artists to come later. And then finally, in architecture, mannerism in architecture is very short-lived, but it has a couple of key elements. It's about taking, regardless of the size of the space, the attitude is add drama, add the, the style. So here, Michelangelo a very famous Renaissance artist, of course. Um, he is a transitional figure. He becomes a Mannerist, uh, and as such, he works on um, in the Vatican and uh, St. Peter's uh, on its the, a redesign of the facade and different wings of St. Peter's, but also on the addition and, and the redesign and the redecoration of what's called the Laurentian Library. And so here, he takes this really, really small space, uh, basically a, a study space, a prayer space for members of the Vatican, and he gives it this amazing, amazing 
large grand feel, a flat coffered ceiling, similar to what we might see in a Roman, an old Roman basilica. Uh, and he takes the outside and brings it in. What looks to be like this, you know, temple fronts and facades. This is, you know, with just giving a, a, a just an amazing level of design. And then, of course, the the most important element is this amazing grand staircase, this back staircase that's out of the way, and, and it's really an almost unimportant space. It's, it's just a, a back entrance almost, but he makes it feel important by giving it this unnecessary, ultimately, but uh, real but amazing treatment. And so the stylization of mannerism is what makes it so important. It's, it's, a, it's a way for the Renaissance artist to f that, or the generation that comes just at the end of the Renaissance to find a new path towards what will become the Baroque. Um, but they'll, they'll, they needed to transition out of the high Renaissance. And, you know, anytime you follow a period of great progress or change or, uh, or just great production, there's going to be kind of a, a growing period where you're going to have to look for identity. And that's what's happening in the Mannerist. All right. So we'll see what happens in, in future styles and future lectures.